is Andrew Jackson. That's what we're going to talk about today. Andrew Jackson was the seventh president of the USA. He was the president and he was also a great military leader um, before he became president. And that was one thing that really helped boost his popularity throughout the United States when running for president. Um, he had the nickname the People's President and the Common Man President because he um, grew up in a, or he was a very different president than prior presidents. The previous six presidents had generally come from New England or Virginia, and they came from privileged backgrounds, and they were very wealthy. Andrew Jackson was the opposite. He came from the West. He had a very difficult childhood, and um, he overcame many obstacles. So he said, as he was running for president, that he could relate with the common man, and that is really going to boost his popularity among new voters. Okay, he also had the name Old Hickory because he was as tough as Hickory. He was a very tough man um, and a very strong military leader. Later, he's going to get the nickname King Andrew. We'll talk about that later. When Andrew Jackson ran for president, he, um, and won, his time period as president was known as the Jacksonian democracy, the idea of spreading political power to all people. No matter how wealthy you are or how poor you are, he said everyone should have um, political power, everyone should have a right to vote. Well, everyone under his idea of everyone should have a right to vote. And um, it really opened up the idea that you did not have to be wealthy and from New England or highly educated um, with many degrees to become president. Now, Andrew Jackson was a lawyer prior to becoming president, and he was a very smart man, but he did not come from a very privileged background. He created what we call the spoil system, which means giving government jobs to political backers. Basically, um, he said, if you support me, if you are my friend, I'm going to put you in a high government position. I'm going to remove people that are not um, politically aligned with my views and who are not supporters of me. And basically the saying, to the victor go the spoils. Many people were opposed to this type of treatment. They felt it was unfair and not wise to have people who did not have political experience uh, being promoted to high political jobs. Andrew Jackson said, um, I know that you think it's unfair, but I love the idea that um, I can have people on my side helping me run the country. Andrew Jackson is going to face three issues as president. We're going to talk about those now. Okay, the first issue he's going to face as president is the Native American policies. How is he going to deal with the um, Native Americans in this newfound land, uh, this very rich, wealthy land between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River? That was prime land. Um, Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, those uh, areas were highly wanted by Western uh, settlers, and Native Americans were all over that area. And they, the settlers wanted the Native Americans off the land. So the first thing Andrew Jackson is going to do is he's going to create the Indian Removal Act, which required the government to negotiate treaties that would require Native Americans to relocate west into what they created as the Indian Territory, which is present-day Oklahoma and parts of Kansas and Nebraska. So they took Oklahoma, which was not the most wanted land in uh, the United States and parts of Kansas and parts of Nebraska and they marked it off and they said this is Indian Territory. We need to move all Native American tribes in the West to this tiny chunk of land um, and it's okay that all the Native Americans speak different languages and all the tribes have different political and religious views. That's okay. They can work it out in Indian Territory. And so he started, they started moving tribes to this area. There's going to be one tribe in particular that does not want to move, and they're going to um, resist. And they are the Cherokee, and a very large group of them were located in Georgia on some prime real estate. And the Cherokee were different than many Native American tribes. They had a political structure, they had a constitution, they had a newspaper, um, they had an educational system, 
and they uh, did not war with any settlers. They were a very peaceful tribe, uh, very civilized, if you will. And Andrew Jackson uh, wanted them to go ahead and move as well. The state of Georgia said, told the Cherokee Nation that they were going to be required to move to Indian Territory, and the Cherokee Nation refused. And this is going to lead to a Supreme Court case called Worcester v. Georgia. And this case was heard by John Marshall, the same guy that's heard the other three court cases we've talked about, and this court case is required uh, for you to know. In this court case, the Cherokees sued the state of Georgia over this forced removal. And John Marshall cited or ruled in favor of the Cherokee. He said, the states do not have the right to move these Native Americans. Only the federal government can do that. And um, when Andrew Jackson hears about Marshall's ruling, he says, okay, John Marshall made his ruling. Now let him enforce it. Basically, he's saying, uh, thank you, John Marshall, for hearing the court case, but um, I don't agree with you. And he told Georgia, you know, basically go ahead and move them. Uh, I'm not going to stand in your way. And so this is going to lead to the Trail of Tears, which was a forced march of over 16,000 Cherokee from their homeland to Indian Territory. The Trail of Tears is a very tragic event in American history where they forced these uh, Cherokees to march on foot and carry what they could of their possessions across Georgia and all of the South into Oklahoma, into Indian Territory. They were um, being forced to keep up a certain pace by the troops that were moving them and it was winter and it was cold and some of them didn't have shoes, they weren't properly dressed, they didn't have enough supplies, and many died along the way. It is a tragedy that this happened in American history. It was a very cruel time uh, in our history and um, so they moved the Cherokees forcefully to uh, Indian Territory. Okay, the second issue that Andrew Jackson's going to face are conflicts over state rights. And I realize I spelled over wrong there. Sorry. Um, so the issue with states' rights is going to start with the Tariff of Abominations in 1828. This is what the South called it. Um, it was a tariff on raw materials and manufactured goods, and it impacted the South greatly. So the issue with this tariff in 1828 was... Um, the South economy was based on agriculture. The Northern economy was based on manufacturing. The South was becoming increasingly more wealthy uh, than the North at this point. And the South had a worldwide market. They sold their cotton to the entire world. When they sold it to Europe and other countries, instead of getting cash for the cotton, they would get credits or vouchers. And so they would sell the cotton, they would get vouchers from Europe, and then they could use these vouchers to buy manufactured goods. Um, the North wanted the South to buy from them. But the South wanted to sell to who got the, and they wanted the South to sell cotton to them so they could turn the cotton into manufactured products and have the South uh, buy it from them. The South, however, wanted to get the best price for their cotton, and so they oftentimes would sell it to Europe, who would give them the best uh, voucher price. When the tariff comes intact, basically what happens is the South then is taxed uh, on any goods they purchase from Europe, and they're having to pay taxes to ship the cotton. And so the price of the products in Europe go up because you have to add in the tax. And it becomes cheaper uh, for the South to purchase from the North than it is from Europe. However, the South is not getting as much for their cotton anymore due to this tax and this inability to uh, really continue trade with Europe um, successfully. And so the South is furious about this tariff. And it gets to the point where we have what is called the nullification crisis of 1828. And it's going to be led by uh, 
Andrew Jackson's vice president, John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. That's right. Andrew Jackson's own vice president is going to lead this movement that Andrew Jackson is strongly opposed to. Basically, John C. Calhoun says we need to um, follow what is called the doctrine of nullification, which is the belief that a state has the right to nullify a federal law within the state. Basically, what uh, Calhoun says is um, if a state feels that a national law uh, violates the Constitution or violates the state's rights, they can nullify or void or not follow that law within the state boundaries. So, with the tariff of abominations, John C. Calhoun in South Carolina say, we are going to nullify, void out, not follow, the tariff within South Carolina's boundaries. Uh, North Carolina, Virginia, all the other states, they can do what they want. But within our state borders, we're not following or paying this tariff. Okay? So South Carolina nullifies the tariff, and um, then they threaten to secede from the Union. Once South Carolina nullifies the tariff, Andrew Jackson becomes quite angry about this and tells South Carolina, you must pay the tariff. You do not have the right to nullify this law. And South Carolina says, we're not paying the tariff, and if you don't get rid of the tariff, we will secede or withdraw from the United States and become our own independent uh, country or nation. Andrew Jackson says, you're not seceding. Uh, and they go back and forth. Uh, South Carolina is on the verge of seceding or withdrawing from the Union, and uh, Andrew Jackson encourages Congress to lower the tariff um, and still South Carolina says no and eventually the tariff is removed and all is well with the uh, country uh, South Carolina removes their threat of secession and we kind of move away from the issue of states rights now it's gonna stay on the back burner but it's solved for the time okay the third issue that Andrew Jackson faced is The war on the bank. We had the second bank of the United States. Remember the first bank was under uh, Alexander Hamilton. So the second bank of the United States is a very powerful bank that held government money and gave out loans. Andrew Jackson greatly disliked the um, second bank of the United States. And here's why. Number one, he distrusted it for personal reasons. He had um, had some real financial issues uh, when he was growing up and when he was a young man, and he distrusted banks. Okay, number two, he thought the bank was too powerful, especially politically. The bank did have a lot of pull politically because they're the ones giving loans out to these government officials, and... Um, Sometimes what would happen is, we'll give you this loan if you'll uh, consider voting this way on this bill. Number three, he believed it favored the wealthy. And Andrew Jackson was the people's president, the common man president, so he had to stand up for the rights of uh, the common people, not the wealthy. And so what he does is he vetoes the bank renewal. Uh, the bank was not quite... Uh, ready to renew their charter, but uh, the bank president at the time felt so confident in the bank and their success that they asked for renewal early, and Andrew Jackson uh, says no. And then he starts pulling the money out of the banks and putting them in, in what we call pet banks around the country. And basically, it causes the bank to collapse, and it has to shut down. It's forced to shut down. Okay, so what were Andrew Jackson's successes as president? Well, first, he uh, encouraged westward movement. You know, he cleared the land off in the west by removing the Native Americans, and that is really going to uh, increase the westward movement out west uh, with, for settlers. He held the nation together. He was able to end the nullification crisis. He was able to bring South Carolina back and uh, remove their threat of secession. And so, ultimately, 
he, ha- he was able to put a Band-Aid over the nation and hold them together. Um, he also expanded voting rights to uh, common people. And these, this expansion of voting rights is what's going to help him become president. And um, it's, it's just a really good thing for the United States. Every time we expanded voting rights to another group of people uh, is a positive when we expanded it to African Americans, when we expanded it to women. Uh, Voting rights are our civic duty, our civic responsibility, and Andrew Jackson helping expand that is a huge success for him. He also had failures. Okay, he, one of his greatest failures is his mistreatment of Native Americans. The second thing is there was a large split in the country. Like I said, he was able to hold the country together Uh, after the nullification crisis, but it was just with a Band-Aid. It wasn't a cure. It wasn't a remedy. It was a solution for the time. And then the third is going to be the Panic of 1837. After the bank collapses, um, we're going to go into a panic, um, a huge recession, a depression, and uh, our country is going to have to figure out how to come out of that economic uh, recession.